Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I always like playing the bad cop. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Hellraiser Inferno, which is Hellraiser 5, which came out in the year 2000, directed by Scott Derrickson. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis for Hellraiser Inferno? Well, the story follows Detective Thorne, played by Craig Sheffer, who is a burnt-out, on-the-edge police officer who likes playing chess and taking drugs. The detective comes across a puzzle box that has seemed to have killed one of his old high school friends and decides that he's going to investigate what this box represents. As he is using the box, he starts to hear from the streets the name The Engineer, who seems to be orchestrating a bunch of murders around the detective. As the de detective starts to investigate deeper, he starts to realise he might be going slightly mad. So Scott Derrickson, who's not really a familiar director, actually would go on from here to work on The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Yeah. He would then also go on to be the writer for the two Sinister films. Yeah. And coming up soon, he's also the writer and director for Doctor Strange for Marvel. Oh, so it's yeah. kind of interesting to see this director kind of going from Hellraiser Inferno all the way to the big time, yeah. really. Yeah. And it's amazing that Hellraiser Inferno ever really got made, you know. Hellraiser <laughs> yeah. 4, Bloodlines, really ended it. Yeah. Pinhead was unceremoniously and undignifiably killed off. And that kind of left a pretty sour taste. And so the studio yeah. the studio were like, well, you know, we still own the rights to Hellraiser and fuck it. Freddy Krueger carried on, Jason carried on, let's let's yeah. let's let's bring him back. And they were like, Okay, so we need a new script. How about we go into our into our, our vault of unusable scripts, take one out? And then just add in Pinhead, chuck in some Cenobites, a bit of mystery, and we'll call it Hellraiser. Yeah, we, 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 oh, we'll, we need we need a Hell title. Yeah, we can't we can't number them anymore. We've forgotten how to count. Yeah, so, so something to do with Hell, uh, uh, Fire, Fire, Inferno. Yes, Inferno. Oh, yeah. And so that is essentially it. And it is, you know, as a fan, when you read that, you just go, "How fucking dare you?" You know, Clive Barker's Hellraiser. And now you just take a random script off the shelf and scroll in Hellraiser on the top of it and go, that'll do. Yeah. That is a big fuck you. And you know what? It, they pretty much did say fuck you to Clive Barker as well because they sent him the script. And, and Clive Barker was like, ah, um, um, this, this. And they just went, yeah, it doesn't matter what you say. We know better. Again. <laughs> How many horror movies have you made, Clive? What, one? Yeah, we don't need to listen to you anymore. They sent the script to Doug Bradley, and Doug Bradley was like, where am I? I'm like, am I in this film? <laughs> and and uh, so he was like, well, you know, am I the only person left now from, from any of the Hellraiser movies attached to the project? Yeah. And the answer is yes, he would be, because he would take probably the biggest paycheck out of anybody working on Hellraiser Inferno. So we will get a pinhead cameo appearance because as i've said he is hardly in this film yeah well that's a kind of a good thing i suppose i mean coming off the back of bloodlines you know and and hellraiser 3 pinhead has been this character shoved in your face right from the beginning of each film but as a horror movie veteran the bad guy always fucking loses and like gary said at the end of hellraiser bloodlines he'd exploded so i was just like well he's done that's it and then you go to your dvd store and you see hellraiser inferno straight to dvd and you're like oh for fuck's sake really well yeah really Why? they put pinhead's face on yeah, the front of it, it again they slap it. doug bradley even turned to the studio and he went don't you put my face on this cover it is not about me <laughs> <laughs> no the idea behind it is is the suffering that's it. That's what Pinhead's been telling us from the first movie. It's the suffering. And, and Jesus, as this series goes on, do I fucking suffer as it goes on? Because I, I, don't, I don't know if I should do this early now at the start of this review. You know, oh, okay, yeah, I, I will. Uh, spoilers. 
okay? If you are planning on watching Hellraiser Inferno and don't want to know what happens, okay, stop the review and go and watch it. Then come back and hi, welcome back. Right. It's basically Jacob's Ladder in Hellraiser. And not even really a... a, a not even like... It's not even like they decided, oh, we're going to do it a bit like Jacob's Ladder. You know, we're not going to... We're, we're not going to do it a bit like Jacob's Ladder. They literally fucking just ripped Jacob's Ladder off. Like I said, you got Detective Thorne, uh, on the edge, burnt out police officer. Starts off playing chess with some professor at a basketball court. That's the best way to show a loose cannon on the edge police officer. <laughs> he's playing chess. Yeah, well, I just love the fact that he's playing chess on a basketball court. Yeah. Or I, I think they're to the side of the basketball yeah, court. Yeah, but the, the way it's framed. Playing, yeah, the way it's framed, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. worth pointing out now that, yes, this is straight to DVD, so this is a non-theatrical release, and it does kind of show when you're looking at the visuals. Yeah. Uh, well, I got that. I got it majorly just from the opening title sequence. Gone is the classic score. Gone is just the dramatic white you, text, white black text, background. Black round, you know, boom, there's your title and into the film. That's that's how a Hellraiser movie did. That's how one and two did it. That's that's how it should be done. And, you know, yeah, Detective Thorne, he's on the edge. He's, he's, he's doing drugs. And... It's like, right, okay, so... But wait a minute. He's not just doing drugs, though. It's the fact that when he turns up to the crime scene and he finds the drugs... Yeah. And then he does a magic, a magic trick, trick to make it disappear. Well... And I'm like... Why did you do that? Because if you didn't get it in the narration, he's good with puzzles. Ooh. But the point of magic is to entertain others. Yeah. But he but all he does is entertain himself with it. Because he's an egotistical dick. That's right. Yeah. This, this guy is just, you're, like I said, he's not only a burnout cop, but he's just a fucking prick. And and you get it from his partner. You know, his, his, his partner is played by... Nicholas Turturro, who you might recognise if you're old like me from NYPD Blue, you know, um, it's kind of all I recognise him from. I you actually know. think that Nicholas Turturro delivers the best acting performance out of anybody in this film. Yeah. I really liked the partner character and really felt quite sympathetic to him. So did I, but obviously I don't want to get too far into it, but he was basically the, the, the fucking chiropractor character from Jacob Ladder. You know, he's trying to save his partner or oh, show him the good side. And his partner's just like, no, no. And they go to a crime scene. And it's just, I, it's, it's so disappointing. that you, It's like you've turned up after a Hellraiser movie had just finished. Yeah, no, but what, 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 what annoyed me even more is I'm sitting down to watch a Hellraiser movie. You know, I've just come off the back of four of them, you know, and the blood and guts is getting less and less. So less, in fact, that when the police officers walk into the crime scene, they stand in front of the camera, in front of the crime scene, and one of the detectives goes, What's that? And I'm like, I don't know, I can't see what it is. What the hell is this? Oh, then they move, and I'm like, Well, I know what it is, I'm not a detective, but it looks like a pile of flesh and bones. <laughs> it looks like Pinhead's leftovers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it is kind of... Like I said, in the other Hellraiser movies, they always open with somebody opening the box and getting torn to pieces. Yeah. And so I'm guessing for this film, it happened off camera or rather off script. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we're left with these police officers investigating this mess. And it's not long before they discover the lament configuration being used as a candle holder. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also Detective Thorne finds the wallet of the victim and he's like, oh, he's a Chinese businessman who I went to school with. Oh, great. There we go. With a five, five minutes into the film, the detective's already got a connection to the Hellraiser victim. The detective's already good with puzzles. Let me guess. He's going to take the puzzle box. Well, he has to, doesn't he? Because if he doesn't, that's the fucking end of the movie. You know? Well, actually, it gets bagged and tagged, and then he 
goes down to the precinct. Yeah. And this this really, really annoyed me how <laughs> he looks at the evidence list and he goes, oh, look, $400. And I'll just cross that, that out and write in $100. $100. Like, no one at, at the evidence room is even going to question it. And well, they don't. They just well, give him the box. Like, yeah, there you go. Because he's got, he's got 10 years in the precinct. He's like the... I don't I know. I, I think he tried to make out at, at some points when he was talking to his partner. Like, he was the most badass cop in the whole station. And I'm like, N- no. You know, if you look at films like... I, I know what he was trying to replicate, what they were trying to replicate. They were trying to do Harvey Keitel, Bad Lieutenant. You know? They were, they were trying to replicate that kind of burnt out character feel. But he was just, this cop was just too cocky. You know, Craig Sheffer, I had a problem with his face. <laughs> I really tried to get look past it, but... It is a made-for-TV face. Yeah, because he, he looks like he's made from a bit of David Baranis, you know? And he, he's made from a bit of that guy, from that teenager from Hellraiser, uh, from Halloween 5. And a tiny little bit of Andrew Divov, the Wishmaster. You know, just the way that this detective carries himself across, walks into a room all cool, you know, snorts some coke off his hand, you know, figures out the box and goes, Hey, look! but it's like it's like it just gets worse because it's like he goes home to his family and his wife's asleep on the sofa his daughter's asleep in bed i I thought that was a cool little shot of hit the reverse upside down head together kind of thing but then then he just he leaves and we get to see how much of a douchebag he really is and he gets even more douchebag points just for the fact that he can justify it to himself oh. so well. He fucks a prostitute just to stay faithful to his wife. I know that would kill her. But if she doesn't know, if doing this keeps me coming back, then who is to say what's right and what's wrong? How does that work? I don't know. <laughs> He's the puzzle master. Yeah. <laughs> He's created a maze of his own destruction. <sighs> All right, okay. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, she's not She's not dead yet. Right, so we're what? 20 minutes in the film, people are having sex and nobody's dead yet. Right, okay. So I get what they're trying to do, you know. They gave us too much Pinhead in Hellraiser 4, so we're going to not give you so much in Hellraiser well, 5. Well, you know, given it was granted that they could only shoehorn Pinhead in so much into this other script. Yeah. And at the same time, it does go with the fact that Less is more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was almost like they were learning. Yeah. Like, we've overdone it. Yeah. So let's hold back. But the detective, you know, he can't sleep. He's a cop on the edge. He's burned out. And he really wants to figure out the box. So he goes to the toilet, unlocks the box, and stumbles out into what appears you know, is a bit of a, like a hallucination. You know, he's hearing a cry, a, a well, child's at, crying. At first, I think it's pretty amazing that he had he spent hardly any time at all with the box. And then the box, like we have seen most recently, pretty much opens itself. Yeah, but this is the thing. I, I had an issue with it because the design for the main box never changes. It's literally a bunch of flat sides and a little dial part, which in most of the movies is usually the thing that the person rubs and then it opens. Yet we obviously we've already discussed in a few of the other uh, few of the other films that there are more boxes, you know. So the question is: is is there only one major box, or are there replica boxes? Is this one of the actual major ones, or is this a replica of the other ones? Because what would be nice is if you just changed the design up every now and again, gave us a different box, so we went, oh, oh, that one looks different. Doesn't look anything like the fucking box from first, first, second, third, and fourth movies. They made a skyscraper out of it fucking four years ago, basically. <laughs> and and he he ends up into this hallucination, and we start to get, we get our first appearance of the Cenobites, uh, which have changed again. I really quite liked the Cenobites. Why you know? am I not surprised? They are very, very sexualized and immensely creepy. Mm. 
the Cenobites always deal with within the flesh and within suffering and torture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it kind of seems like y- you would maybe send these Cenobites into teas. Yes. Before you bring the pain. Uh, and just the way that they move, I think that they, you know, these are the most graceful moving Cenobites we've seen. It, it works very well, and it, it, it works even more when that you've got that half-body thing going it's up a, the it's stairs. It's the half a chatterer. Yeah, half a, ch- <laughs> half a chatterer. And I started to get a bit of a, um, is it Guillermo del Toro? You know, Pan's Labyrinth, the whole the thing. Well, it with the was eyes. interesting that they asked Del Toro to come and direct. I think it was Hellraiser Bloodlines. Yeah, <laughs> they should, they, he should have. He should have picked it up. Um, but, you know, you got Thorn. He's being chased by the, the Cenobites. He opens the door. Pinhead rips his face off and he wakes up in the bathroom. And you're like, ah. Oh. It was a dream. Oh, wait. That's right. It's fucking Jacob's ladder. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, a pinhead usually shows up at your doorstep and tears your face off. It's usually over. Yeah, you're usually dead. So I'm guessing at this from this point onwards in the film, he maybe didn't open the box and he dreamed it because otherwise he would be dead. Yeah, but... Unless... <laughs> yeah, you know, because well, they've already established that the cop can't sleep and he's taking too many drugs and he's living life on the edge. So when he does wake up, I'm like, dude, that's not good for you. I don't, if you sleep, you're fucking dead. You know, but he 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 leaves the prostitute. He, he goes back to the police station. He's talking to his partner and, and we get the phone call from the prostitute. You were with me last night and oh my God! Ah, oh my God. And it's really quite disgusting the, over the phone. Well, it's it's great again. You yeah. know, it's well. You know, I say it's great because Hellraiser loves to show you the gore. Yeah. Whereas in this one, it's also great because this film likes to let your imagination show you the gore, and all you hear is her gargling, like seriously gargling on blood, it and was, that's it. It kind of it started off like a uh, like an orgasmic scream. Like, yeah. Like she was weirdly getting off on it which is kind of cool for the Hellraiser to the point where like you said it gargles and you kind of you're thinking oh my god something really nasty has happened it, it doesn't this this what this, another annoying fucking scene for me because the detective's like partner we've got to go somewhere and his partner's like where and so they go to the hotel and the detective walks in looks at the body and we don't see it and he goes outside and he tells his partner to go look at the body and the partner goes and looks at the body and we still don't fucking see it then they clean the room, and I'll get to the point what really annoys me about this scene. They clean the room and clean all the fingerprints off, because obviously Detective Thorne has been there from the night before. And then we see the body, and she's not ripped to pieces. She's what, strangled? I think, so, yeah, she was like, had a final destination death. Yeah. Where she got caught up in the shower thing. And she's got blood on her. And... This is what annoyed me because I'm I, I'm not a detective, but Detective Thorne doesn't want to get fired from the police department because well he'll lose his pension and his family. Oh yeah, well his pension, <laughs> and he so he decides to set up his partner. Oh, I'll leave the pen that your wife gave you at the at the at the prostitute location and I'll throw the box of cigarettes underneath the bed and you know and I'll imply it was you if you imply it was me and I'm like wait. Aren't your fingerprints and DNA all over the hanging corpse's body in the bathroom? And probably, God knows what, left in the bed. <laughs> yeah! Hmm. Did you just... <laughs> what? So now you just incriminated them both. Well, <laughs> way to go, you douchebag. <laughs> it's the fact that, you know, he's just like, Hey, partner, I really need you to help me out here. Yeah. And now I'm going to fucking set you up as well. You asshole. Look at me, Tony. We now get into the crux of the film where Joseph, Detective Joseph, is trying to figure out who the serial killer is. Yeah. And he soon figures out that he's chasing someone called the Engineer. And straight away as a Hellraiser fan, you're going, what? That weird creature that's hanging around in the corridors from the first film. 
that's the engineer. And so we're like, ooh, more mystery. Maybe we're going to figure out more about this engineer. Yeah. And then we follow Detective Joseph as he goes and questions his implied pedophile snitch about yeah. who the engineer might be. He, he questions Bernie, the ice cream seller. And Bernie doesn't want to tell him about the engineer. Nobody wants to tell Detective Thorne about the engineer. It seems like everybody on the street knows about the engineer, except Detective Thorne, who's probably been, who's been working on the streets for 10 years. And Bernie's like, I'm going to tell you the Kaiser Soze story. Where, if, if you've not seen Usual Suspects, please stop the video and go and watch it, and then come back and you'll know who Kaiser Soze is. But basically, it's like, oh, you know, the engineer told this man not to get married to this woman. So then they ran away. And he kidnapped the woman and then kept sending bits of her back to the man until one day the man came back and there was a decapitated, her decapitated head in his bed. Well, yeah, I mean, it does sort of add to the lore to the... What the... F what yeah, the no, I, was gonna, I was waiting for that. <laughs> what, what is this? I mean, he even left a handwritten note. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... I I'm, I've never read the Hellbound Heart, so I don't know all the lore and stuff about the Engineer, but from what I read going into these movies, the Engineer was that fucking thing in the fucking, in the first movie. So that's what I see as the Engineer, you know? Then in this movie, they're like, the Engineer, you know, fucking kidnaps these women, and all I could imagine was that fucking thing crawling around chasing women, and somehow amazingly holding her down and cutting her head off. Putting her in a bed, pulling the quilt up, and writing a note. <laughs> you know? But, uh, it's, you know, so Joseph, not exactly happy with his answer, decides that he's going to continue beating up his snitch anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. And So he's a, uh, still a dick. <laughs> he's still an absolute <laughs> dick. And what I find interesting is that he does eventually keep catching glimpses of the faceless Cenobite. Who just keeps turning up here and there, yeah. whether he's hallucinating him, whether he's seeing him in the police precinct, whether he's seeing, you know, as he goes to the the stigmata piercing club yeah. and starts questioning people there and he sees the Cenobite tattoo on the guy's back. So I'm like, the Cenobites don't really like to play mind games with you. It's kind of like, it's something entirely different. Yeah. But at the same time, the creepiness factor of watching it does still work. It it does, but but it works because we've seen it before in Jacob Ladder. You know when you see the quick glimpses of the faceless man, you're you're like, okay, that's not normal. You know, but it's not a Cenobite, is it? Well, it's it it's, it, it's, 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 it's it's halfway there. It's <laughs> well, yeah yeah, but it, but but. It's not. It's like we said. It's a hallucination. We're we're led to believe it's a hallucination. You know, we're watching the degradation of the psyche of Detective Thorne. And actually, there is one thing that we have completely forgot to mention with all the people that are obviously getting caught up in the caught story. up in this is that at each one of the crime scenes, we are finding a child's finger. With the fingerprint burnt off. In the first crime scene where he first found the box, we found the finger inside a candle. Uh, after Bernie is killed on videotape by the faceless one, you know, we watch him place the finger into uh, a cash register. And these fingers keep turning up. So Detective Thorne believes he is chasing the engineer who has got a child hostage. And it's like, well, I, no, because... For me, what the film is showing me is that these things that Detective Thorne is seeing are very real to him. But everybody else that exists in Thorne's world are blind as bats or or it's not there, you know. But none of them decide, actually, we should take him off the case. Well, his, uh, his, his boss, you know, the chief of the police actually goes, you know what? You need to take a break. So as a matter of fact, uh, you need to go see the psychiatrist now. I'm going to go lie down and talk about my childhood. And we're introduced to James Remar. Yay! Who's almost unrecognisable underneath that beard. Yeah. And glasses. And he hasn't and, got long blonde hair anymore. And he's also acting really nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I felt really comfortable with James Remar. It's like, it, it was almost like 
he could convince me how to kill people and put them in plastic bags and drop them in the ocean. Almost, yeah. <laughs> but Detective Thorne, he's really getting to the end now. You know, his his, his snitch has been killed. He's he's hearing phone calls regarding about his parents. He's gone to a local cowboy club. Happened there. He got beaten up by <laughs> cowboy ninjas, dude. He got beaten up yeah. by cowboy I, ninjas. I, I, I felt, I mean, there was points in the film where <laughs> I felt like it was jumping ahead of yeah. itself. And, yeah. You know, I can't, you kind of, if you zone out for even like five <laughs> seconds in this film and come back into it, you're like, what did I miss? <laughs> because all of a sudden he's in a completely different location. He's out in the forest with these weird blue neon lights and these. Cowboy ninja warrior females jump out at him. Yeah, he'd he'd been talking to uh he'd been talking to a guy inside the cowboy saloon who knew the engineer or or knew the engineer but wouldn't tell Detective Thorne about the engineer. And then Detective Thorne lead, looks over and lo and behold the faceless man is there. You know, it's like it's been all set up. And he chased the face the faceless man outside, starts to hallucinate the Cenobites, and then gets beaten up by cowboy ninjas. And not just any cowboy ninjas. These are female cow. These are cowgirl ninjas. You know, they beat him up, and the guy from inside comes out and goes, "Hey, detective, you dropped your gun. Here you go. See ya." It's so weird that shot where the camera's just looking up at them as he's just standing <laughs> yeah. over Detective Joseph. It's just like, am I still watching Hellraiser? Yeah, am I still? <laughs> Where are we? What I can only imagine mind? that maybe that was supposed to have been Pinhead. I, I, it just it just felt really odd. It, that, that, for me, was the oddest scene in the entire film. That, I suspect, is the object of the game. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It, it starts to get a bit more weird. But the thing that, the thing, another thing that annoyed me as well was we've just come off the back of Hellraiser Bloodlines and... The Cenobites, obviously at this point, have have come back from the skyscraper. So, in this weird timeline, have already met Merchant. Yet, you know, people looking into the backstory of the Lament configuration box are have no clue or are too afraid to actually bring up any reference to the toy maker. Well, you know, I, I, or, or anything like that. It's just a box that has been around for centuries, they say. Well, yeah, I like... I like One of my favourite scenes in the film is with Dr. Paul Gregory mm. and Joseph Thorne, yeah. when the psychiatrist is literally explaining how, yes, he does... He has researched some about this box. Yeah, and yeah. He mentions that it's been lost. Uh, he mentions that it, ha it holds untold pleasures and yeah. that, that perhaps demons come from it. Or open, sorry. He says that it's either a key or a gateway to another dimension. Yeah. And I like that. I was like, you know what? It, it, it tells a new audience member enough and it's faithful to, you know, the other films. And it's the first time that he's ever called it the Lament Configuration. It's called the Lament Configuration. It appears in occult literature here and there throughout the centuries. What do they say about it? They say it's a window or a gateway. You open it, they come for you. Yes, but they played it very easy. They played yeah. it very easy because he goes, oh, it opens a doorway to another dimension and you meet these beings. Some call them Cenobites, others call them demons. Joseph Ford, yeah, he's, he's getting to the end now. He, his mind's his mind's gone. The engineer, it, it, what was it? He's told if you're if you're chasing the engineer, the engineer is actually chasing you. If the game is, if if you believe this is a game, it's because it is a game, and the and the and it's playing you. It's playing you. One of my other favorite sequences in the film is when he does go to the hospital and he's there to see his parents. I believe. Yes. And the yes. doctors are like. Phew. No one's ever come and visited these. Dude. Are you sure they have a son? Yeah. And it just, again, just goes to show how much of a douchebag he is that even when his parents were in hospital, he never visited them, not once. No. And so he tries to, tries to get in there and we do get literally my, my most memorable scene in the film when 
the old man in the wheelchair oh, yeah. goes down the corridor with the Joker smile, and he's got the Joker smile from the chains, and he laughs like a child. Yeah, oh, I was just so like, so that creepy. is so fucking creepy. <laughs> <laughs> This is where the film actually started to pick up, you know. Like I said, uh, you know, like I said, it had this Jacob's Ladder thing running through, but that's because to a trained eye, if you've seen the film, you know, you pick up these little nods. If you haven't seen it, you, you might get it as the film comes to an end, but it literally started to pick up after he's gone home, he's seen his family, his daughter's really upset, and he gets a phone call saying, Oh, you're the engineer is coming to see your parents, and so he's up and gone. And he goes, and like I said, they've got that cool corridor sequence. He goes in and sees his mum and his dad. His dad's bedridden. Mum's constantly knitting and keeps uh, belittling him about why he doesn't come visiting us. And you know that something's not right when we keep seeing this child's bedroom that the detective ends up going into. And he ends up going in there through his dad's clothes cl cupboard. The door closes behind and we start to hear the screams from his mum, the ripping of flesh, the sounds of chains, there's blood coming under the door. And I'm like, that's good, but I know it's hallucination, so he's gonna wake up now. Oh, oh it's kind of like Final Destination. For fuck's sake, stop stealing from other films! <laughs> you know? But this film starts to pick up then because he, he races to the hospital and, and he comes across his parents' bedroom and it's empty. And he's like, where are they? Where are they? Oh, they're not in bed. It's all messy. Ew, I, don't, I don't want to touch that. <laughs> Gets himself a shotgun and starts to fight zombie versions of all the people that have been killed up to this point. It does all of a sudden turn into a bizarre action sequence where, yeah, he just blasts everybody. Yeah. And including his partner. I, it's his partner. You might be able to tell me. I might have missed all the other symbology, but his partner is killed by the faceless man. Yeah. Stabbed in the back, well, which is a symbol. It's a symbol of, of how, yeah, how Joseph betrayed him and betrayed stabbed him. him in the back. Right. Yeah. I, that's, the, that's it. So, so with his, so the, I mean, that was the symbology for his partner. His parents were, were blind to all the things he was doing because obviously they've got their eyes yeah. so shut. Yeah. We never see you anymore. We don't like it here. Frozen his wife and his daughter out of his life. So obviously yeah. that, that's I, And that's also a very, very great imagery. And that's what tortures him, you know, because once he starts killing all these people and finds his family on that pillar, James Remar turns up behind him, and I was—I thought it was really cool that his little gold crucifix was upside down, which never biblical reference there. And James Remar is like, "Ah, oh, yeah, you got to go home. You got you got to go home. You shouldn't be here. This isn't the home I told you to go to. I meant you go to the other home." And the cops like, "Why? What's going on? What's going on?" And I start to start to really enjoy the suffering. I started to enjoy the suffering then, and I'm like, "Oh, this is good." He he's he's being burned. He all the pain that he's caused, it's coming back on him. Oh, I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> We are then given this transformation sequence, yep. which I like the visuals. So, yeah, to a point. To some, a point. some, some, some a of point. the some of the the nails kind of look a bit too CGI'd as yeah. they transform him, and uh, and I don't like the popping sounds that each of the pins make <laughs> as as they as it spawns in. But what I really like is the fact that Pinhead now just says it's as good a name as any. Yeah. And it's just like, what's that? Because he's not being called Pinhead. He prefers the name <laughs> Engineer. <laughs> Engineer. It's as good a name as any. <laughs> and Pinhead has made his made his mark, <laughs> but <laughs> I I got I got a bit confused by this because obviously Pinhead's just literally uh, changed from James Remar to Pinhead, and I'm like, you know, I know that Pinhead can teleport or walk down the street. He can do, pretty much do whatever he wants. And he turns to the cop. The cop's lost his family. He's at breaking point. And he says to the cop, you know, you've got to go home. I'll show you the way. Literally just turns around and walks off. 
walks into the walks into the kitchen like see ya <laughs> see ya why ya and then the cop but the, but it, it kind of catches up because the I, I i expected the cop to have to leave the kitchen get in his car and drive across town again to get to where he needs to go but he doesn't he, he walks through the kitchen and boom he's at home and he's at his family's home and he sees his sees his younger self there and you know his dad's sleeping but his mum's really nice and it fucking pissed me off because I'm like, so you've got no excuse for being a douchebag. You're just, a, you, you've just developed yourself like that. Well, okay. Anything that you've got coming your way, you fucking deserve for all the pain and suffering you've caused. Absolutely. The film, you know, pulls no punches in establishing how much of an asshole this guy is. He is so selfish and so arrogant uh, you know, he's unfaithful. Yeah. He breaks the law at every turn. A lot of people have problems with Hellraiser Inferno because he's not a nice guy. And as we've already said, the, the purpose is not for him to be a nice guy, for him to be an asshole. Not so that we can root for Pinhead to finally give him his comeuppance, but just because it yeah. does actually make him a fairly interesting character. There's no rule to say that you can't have a douchebag as your main character. Yeah, and, and it flips it round now because... Yo, we enjoy Pinhead. We, we we this is why we're watching a horror movie. We enjoy the 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 horror character doing its thing. What we what we kind of what burns us out after a while is is heroes constantly coming along and beating the shit out of the villain. You know, the horror character. They do these massive speeches and then they end up losing. Just look look at fucking bloodlines. You know, but in this one, Pinhead doesn't have these great speeches. He has good speeches, but it's like. You're not going anywhere, Thorn. You're you're not. You know, like I like I said, you know, you don't want to use it again. But obviously, Jacob's ladder. He's in hell. Is the big twist. It's the big twist. I love that shot of of the little boy in the chair and he's missing fingers because they've been leaving at the crime scenes. And then you've got the faceless man turning up and ripping his face off to reveal he's Thorn. And then Pinhead stands in the middle, middle of them and says, basically, this is your spirit and this is your flesh. And your flesh is killing your spirit. And then pulls him apart, pulls Fawn apart with chains. It's all a puzzle, isn't it, Joseph? Like a game of chess, perhaps. That's fucking awesome. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's really cool. It's 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 kind of a shame that we had to wait this long to get to the point in that, but the whole build up and the whole setup really works. Yeah. You know, granted, there's not as much Hellraiser in the film as a lot of fans were kind of anticipating and hoping. It, it really is a departure from the over the top excessive amounts of pinhead and centibytes and gore yeah. to this really refined small story which obviously was what the original script kind of had and just adding pinhead and doug bradley into the mix that speech at the end which i believe doug bradley also kind of improvised a little bit and added on to considering nice. that you know his original writers are not writing for him anymore you are your own king and this is the hell you have created for yourself He pulls them off. He's, he pulls them off very well. And it it works even more with the film with the fact that once Fawn has been pulled apart by chains, he wakes up in the bathroom again. And it's kind of like a, oh, I've been redeemed. I've got one more chance kind of thing. No, no, no. It's like Groundhog Day in Hellraiser. Oh, these movie references in this fucking film. It's like Groundhog Day in, in Hellraiser. Because he goes back to the police station. He gets the phone call again. He pulls the gun out and puts it in his mouth, just like James Remar predicted. Well, I, I like the fact that he's just like, oh, you know, I've, it was all a dream. I've been given another chance. It's going to be okay. And then in his face, when he gets that phone call, he's like, yeah. no, no, it's, it's continuing. Detective Thorne. Yeah, and yeah, and he blows his brains out. No! Don't do it! 
And you then you ask the question like, so when did he, when did he start in hell? Was he in hell before the film began? Did he go to hell the first time he opened the box? Yeah. And I put forward the argument that he was in hell during the opening credits of the film. Him yeah. finding and getting the box was just hell, just helping him create the puzzle, put the pieces of the puzzle there for him. And because it would, because when he does have the meeting with the psychiatrist who tells him, yes, there was another cop who found the box yeah. who and the box disappeared and then he went crazy after having visions and blew his brains out. And in his delusions, he elevated the engineer to a figure of almost supernatural power. He said the engineer knew everything about every cop on the force, especially him. For me, this film is, it's, it's like a short story. It's like if you had a Hellraiser book and you got through like Hellraiser 1 and 2 and were like, oh, that was really good. And then you just have like a five minute story about a cop who finds the box. Well, yeah, I mean, like like in Hellraiser 2, you saw Frank's personal hell. You also got to see Tiffany's personal hell. Yeah. And now in this one, you get to follow Joseph's personal hell for the entire duration of the film. Yeah. Now, that is what does really piss off and it almost is a complete divide now for Hellraiser fans where on one half you've got all the Hellraiser fans going no fuck you where's the blood and guts and Hellraiser yeah, and lore the and, and, and the chains and everything else and why's Pinhead only got two minutes of screen time fuck this film and then you've got other people that are going no wait this brings Hellraiser back to its roots where it would tell this story of of a person who is corrupted by their own desires and, uh, yeah. you know, the whole less is more. The, the fact that Pinhead turns up just to, to deliver the punchline and leave again. He's not the most important player. It is all about watching this person suffer. And again, the reason why there is the split and the reason why Clive Barker and to an extent Doug Bradley turned around and looked at Inferno and went, fuck it. That is the worst Hellraiser movie of the entire lot. Because Pinhead and Hell... And the Leviathan and the Lament Configuration and everything to do with Hellraiser is all about the suffering of the flesh and the suffering of the skin and of the body. Mm. Yet the whole of Inferno is all about the psychological torment. And the spirit. Which, and the spirit. Well, granted, you know, Pinhead, I'm sure, would enjoy devouring and breaking the spirit of people while he tears their flesh off. Yeah, 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 but yeah, this yeah. was all about breaking them psychologically. Yeah. Because it was... But at the same time, I'm like, well, if you look at Hellraiser 2, it was all psychological torment about in Frank's personal hell, where he's being teased. You know, that was psychological. But granted, he was teasing him with the flesh. Yeah, yeah. Whereas in this one, it's it's all about, you know, losing your family or losing your job or yeah. losing your, your, you know, your, your working partner, which he doesn't really care for anyway. Yeah, he doesn't care for so, any of this. Until it so to... it, it, there is a clear divide where, yeah, the Hellraiser legacy really is about body torture and Inferno is psychological torture, more so. So I can understand that divide. But I have many favourite scenes in Inferno. There's, there's, I, I would, they're not the the highlight of the entire Hellraiser franchise. Yeah. But you know, when you come off the back of Bloodlines, it's just nice to have, um, it's nice to have some Cenobites that really do feel quite authentic. Yeah. And they are very creepy. Yes, as you've said, it, it does incorporate, you know, Jacob's Ladder, especially the hospital sequences yeah. where it's just lots of blood and it's freakiness. Just the, just the faceless man. And and the, and, faceless, and the man. faceless man turning up as well. You know, so I guess my favourite scene, is, because it's, he's only really in one scene, is the pinhead final speech sequence. Your flesh is killing your spirit. <laughs> Yes, Joseph. Oh, yes. Yeah, me, you know, after I got over the halfway point of the movie and, you know, had fully accepted that, you know, I knew that this guy was, he wasn't going anywhere. He was fucked pretty much from the beginning of the film. I was just like, right, okay, let's let's, let's just go run down. You know, people are just dying. He's, he's not going to win this. And it was, you know, it's like the relationship he had with his daughter. He goes back to his family's house after he's been beaten up by the cowboy ninjas. And, um, and his daughter's just like, Daddy, are you staying home? And he's like, oh, no, I'm going again. And I'm like, well, there's your big mistake. You know, she, she's practically begging you to stay and you 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 won't so you know after that you can you can really just go get fucked basically but 
you know, from the from the corridor sequence of the old people's home to getting the shotgun out and blasting all the zombie versions of all the victims to seeing his to seeing his his family on the pillar, you know, and frozen, realizing that you know that his 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 child innocence is lost and his his he himself has forced himself into the position the the pinhead sequence and waking and this this the film ending on the fact that he's screaming at the screen like no i'm trapped in hell no and i'm like fuck you, <laughs> you know, the, the whole half ending the, pretty much the halfway point to the end it's really good the build up to that you just gotta work your way through which is why I have real no qualms in recommending Hellraiser Inferno. You, if you haven't seen it before, you kind of have to decide for yourself as to whether this does fit into the Hellraiser universe or not. I know a lot of people would wish it be omitted from the Hellraiser storyline, <laughs> you know, but because but simply because of that insulting nature of the fact that it's not a Hellraiser script, the fact that Hellraiser yeah. was shoehorned into it, yeah, yeah. and for me, I, th I think it worked in its favour. That it because as as I have said, you know, they've overdone the gore and 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 the messiness of Hellraiser, and so kind of having a portion of it put in, I think it it works, yeah, yeah. For, for better or worse. And uh, I think that the acting was pretty competent. I think that the story was fairly interesting. I think that the characters were fairly well developed. I think that the special effects worked fairly well as well. I really like the Cenobites. I'm seeing thought, a pan here, Gary. <laughs> fairly. Fairly, yeah. <laughs> it's it's all... It's, see, it's not excellent. It's not outstanding. No. But it's not average. It's just... It's it's just above average. And so I, I, I do enjoy it. So I do recommend Hellraiser Inferno. It's not boring. It's kind of captivating because you yeah. do get pulled into this dreamlike nature of the entire film. I don't know whether it was the fact that the backing music to a lot of the scenes in this film was just very light drums, almost tribal music, right, yeah. that just kept it going and going and going. <laughs> I, I I definitely recommend Hellraiser Inferno, mainly because if you've got after the end of Bloodlines, fucking just keep fucking going. Seriously. Hellraiser, it's all about the suffering, okay? If the films get fucking worse, then good, we're supposed to suffer. If they get better, then then good, because then we get to enjoy the suffering of the people in the films. I was very surprised by this one, you know, because after Bloodlines, I was just like, that's it, I just don't, I don't want to watch anymore. I got halfway through this film and I really just wanted to fucking turn it off and then, you know, crazy shits just started to happen and I'm like, yeah, just just get to the end. Just fucking get to the end. Boom, boom, shotgun, zombies. Ooh. I just hope that in the next one they don't just bring in some character from the first movie. Well, it's funny you should say that because Kirsty's coming back to oh. Hellraiser. This game is over. Do you hear me? Oh, I hear everything. And soon you will know everything. Much more than you want, I guarantee it. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews.